You found it. Your home for the best content on your favorite team, the Fighting Tigers of LSU. Do us a favor, subscribe to the channel, leave your comments below, and be sure to smash that like button. I think you would probably agree that LSU's offense uh, coming into this season and even going into Mississippi State, we felt really good about that. It, we, you could go back to the Florida State game and and you could maybe express concerns, but I think a lot of that is concerns rooted in the echo chamber. If you really look at the Florida State game, LSU had 300 yards of offense in the first half. You had a bad quarter that was magnified because of drops. And I'm not trying to get sideways with, well, could the ball have been better? Point is, you had two costly drops, one that ended a drive and one that on, on, that ended consecutive drives, and then you had a receiver fall down, led to a pick. We know what happened. My point is, for three quarters, your offense moved the ball up and down the field against Florida State. You were bad in the fourth quarter, and you were bad in the red zone. That, that's basically, you had two possessions inside the 10 where you got no points. That's what it boils down to. But you moved the ball. Grambling, you scored 10 out of 10 possessions. Mississippi State, you were awesome for four quarters. Point, we can all agree, LSU's offense really good. The concern this team has is what happens if you get into a situation where you bog down in the red zone. You have a couple of turnovers against a good team. How, how does that play out? Well, we saw it against Florida State. Can your defense pick up the slack? Well, against Florida State, the answer was no. Because they could, they, they went seven straight possessions without getting a stop. So, it's a very that was a very legitimate question. Remains a very legitimate question about, about the defense. Because the concern that we saw against Florida State, it only continued to build after the first three possessions against Grambling, where you're looking at the secondary going, man, are, are they going to be able to stop anybody? Well, I think the Mississippi State game, and albeit a small sample, showed us some very important growth with this team. And it's not that dissimilar from what we saw a year ago. Do you remember the Florida State game, the opener, in 2022? I mean, Mike Jones and Greg Penn were your starting linebackers in that game. Micah Baskerville hadn't emerged. Harold Perkins was a non-factor against Florida State. Your Colby Richardson was one of your starting corners. Makai Gardner, the other. We hadn't seen Jark Bernard Converse emerge yet. My point is, like, the team, as it went along, continued to learn more about itself. And Brian Kelly even alluded to that on Monday when he said, look, you bring in 17 transfers and all these freshmen. Yeah, it's going to take some time to learn. Well, it feels like we're getting to that point where we're learning what else LSU has. And Brian Kelly said it point blank today. Like, the thing this game showed is they have more guys they can count on. I think what it shows more than anything else, and, and Coach and I were talking about this, Coach House, is that we have more than 11, and, and we need to play them more. It's kind of like what we talked about the week before with um, Guillory and, and certainly Jefferson at the tackle position. They didn't play enough the week before. They played much more, and you can see how that helps our rotation at the defensive line. I think you'll see now that we can play a lot more at the linebacker position and the safety position. Um, I'll, t I'll get to linebacker and safety in just a second, but let me start um, at – well, real quick, as he mentioned, we've got more than 11 and on the defensive line. Yes, absolutely. It's easy to say Mason Smith and Mekhi Wingo, go get them, but – you really like Jordan Jefferson, his ability to push the pile. We saw Paris Shand get in there and get a TFL playing that that big end spot on the left end behind Savion Jones. Savion Jones put on a lot of weight this year to become a a more uh, versatile player as a guy that can that's big enough to stop the run, and athletic enough enough to rush the pa or rush the passer. And we saw that with Savion. He had a TFL, he had a sack, had a tackle in the game, so he's becoming a little more versatile in that respect. We also saw on Saturday Deshaun Womack. I don't know if you noticed this, but when LSU went dime, meaning six defensive backs, they put Deshaun Womack in at that left end. And so what it did, it, so Savion Jones came off the field, Womack went on. So if you have Womack and Harold Perkins and Braden Swinson all on the field at the same time, well, now you have a super like 
fast, athletic down line. You're not as big, but man, you should be able to affect the passer. And they did. They were able to do that. So you're seeing them figure out their rotations. And you know, we're going to talk a lot about Whit Weeks and the job he did, but Brian Kelly pointed out the importance of Greg Penn's emergencies last two weeks. The guy that's really settled this for us in terms of, you know, whoever he's been with has been Greg Penn. Greg's been outstanding. He's a settling factor out there for us. He gets guys lined up. Uh, he communicates very well. And, and that's a guy that uh, we want to keep on the field. So, you know, we'll be moving guys around to complement that. And, and I think, you know, the best rotation keeps Greg on the field, and then we'll move guys in and out with him. The best rotation keeps Greg Penn on the field. The best rotation keeps Greg Penn on the field. They're looking at Greg Penn as the linchpin of this defense because, and listen, Greg Penn showed you a year ago he could do this. He was an 80-tackle guy as a rotational player last year with Baskerville really being the dude in the middle. And you bring in Omar Spates, and Omar Spates, we expect Omar Spates is going to have a key role in this defense. He's played in 47 career games, and he's been a 100-tackle guy, and he's going to be a key cog. But with Greg Penn's emergence, what that tells you is it, it, there is no need at all to even ever talk again about Harold Perkins going inside. Because if you're confident with Penn and saying other rotations on there, so it's Penn and Spates. Penn and Whitweeks, Penn and Westweeks, or if you want to go to odd fronts where he's your only backer off ball. There, listen, Matt House can figure that out. He's way smarter than me. I'm not even pretending, but to like give him ideas. But the point is, you feel like you felt like moving Perkins inside was out of out of necessity to take that really impactful guy and make him impact the offense on three downs in a variety of ways when you don't need him to do that. It's not his best spot, and you've got guys who can do it. So, yes, Greg Penn playing that role was massive, but the other thing it did is it's allowed Harold Perkins to find himself again. And Brian Kelly talked about that today with Harold Perkins, you know, like finding the way to impact the game like he did a year ago in a lot of different ways. Just playing with that energy, you know, playing with that edge. You know, he's got to learn where that balancing act is, right? We don't want to get him in a position where he's taking a swing at somebody and he's out of the game. But he's got to play with energy. He's got to play with emotion. That's that's how he plays the game the best. And I thought he brought that. I thought he brought that competitive edge. And that's that's going to put him in a position to get to the quarterback and set the edge and run people down. And you just got to play. He's just got to play that way. And I think he was tweaking it and trying to find that. Early on, he was playing inside. He was thinking a lot. He was slowing down. I think he's coming back to finding what that balance is. I mean, it's hilarious. It's a little hilarious to say he was playing inside. He was thinking a lot like, yes, but you all put him there. Like that, I mean, I don't know. I still don't know. Maybe Harold will talk about this at some point. We get to talk to him. But I don't know if it was at his behest that to, to move inside or if the coaches wanted to move him inside. We never really got clarification on that, on whose decision that was, idea that was. But ultimately, yeah, he was thinking a lot because it, like that was a, a tough transition changing positions like that. Well, with Greg, it's like in baseball. We always talk about baseball. You got to be solid up the middle, right? Catcher, shortstop, center field. You got to be solid up the middle. It's the same on defense. You know, interior presence that can push the pocket and stop the run. Middle linebacker that can shed blockers and and protect the middle of the field. Safety, you know, which is your your your, your center fielder there. You got to be good up the middle. And with LSU having Mason Smith and Greg Penn. I think they found, something, be it Major Burns or Ryan Yates, I think they found something with Ryan Yates, y'all, too. We'll come to that in a second. But, like, you're good at the middle. That allows Harold Perkins to go play on the edges. Go play on the edges and affect the game in every way you can. Make them recognize you. And he did that, man. Look at Harold Perkins' final stat line. Four tackles, two solo, a sack, two TFLs, a pass defense. He affected the game in so many ways, and that's where he's at his best. Now, the other thing that was awesome to see was Whit Weeks have the day he did? Brian Kelly on the decision to start Whit Weeks on Saturday. First of all, he has elite speed at the position. He can cover the field. He can run mistakes down. And when you can run mistakes down, you know, that gives you a real advantage in terms of playing the position. The second thing is he sees an open gap, he's going to take it. Now, you saw that early in the game. He shot the gap, TFL. He's got 
you know, obviously there's a learning curve there. There are some things that he did that, you know, we're going to have to continue to work with. But when you have a guy that's that athletic, uh, has a really good sense in pass coverage, he's not lost out there in pass coverage. And, and I would say that that probably is the reason why he's out there because he's not lost in anything. Can he get better in areas? Absolutely. And then he makes up for a lot of that with high-end athletic ability. That was the second play of the game that Brian Keller was talking about. First play of the game, 12-yard completion. Second play of the game is when Week shot the gap and got the TFL. He's, he's special, and we've talked about him a lot because you can't talk to the LSU coaches without them raving about Whit Weeks. Now, I thought with Spates out, they were going to start West Weeks, third-year player, guy who's, who's played a ton of football, going to be assignment sound. Whit Weeks, the younger brother, obviously has the higher ceiling, so the fact that they were comfortable going with him as a true freshman, his third collegiate game on the road, SEC open and saying, go get him, kid. And all he did was lead your team in tackles. Eight tackles on the day for Whit Weeks. Awesome. It just continues to solidify you there in the middle. And that was phenomenal to see. And then I, I know we talked about it as well, but Ryan Yates at safety. Look, I think when you look at Major Burns, there's a couple of things that are obvious. One... As a as a downhill safety, when you ask him to come up and, and be physical and help in the run, Major Burns is very good there. Where he's probably deficient is in the pass coverage part of the game. Ryan Yates playing that deep middle is a is just better in pass coverage. So picking your spots and when you're gonna play major close to the lines and Yates deep or however you're gonna do it, you're starting to to learn more about this defense and who you can trust where and what schemes and in what situations. And so to take it back to where Brian Kelly started, yeah, you got more than 11. You got way more than 11. And they're learning their personnel. And the more they learn their personnel and their strengths, you got to trust Matt House, a good defensive coordinator, is going to put him in position to make plays. So it's a different challenge this week with K.J. Jefferson. They got three really good receivers at Arkansas. Rocket Sanders is a... Uh, he's a great running back. He hadn't played the last two weeks because of a knee injury, but if Sanders is good to go and K.J. Jefferson is healthy and those receivers are ready to roll, that is a much different challenge than LSU just faced in Starkville, but a challenge with their numbers LSU should be up for. So Tigers, uh, a huge step forward for this defense Saturday in Starkville against the Bulldogs. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please leave your comments. I love to interact, and be sure to hit the red subscribe button below.